thank you all for, for joining. And we're going to dive right in. I'm going to skip the question about how bad this crisis is going to be, uh, how far it's going to go. Is it a once in a lifetime uh, thing? I think increasingly we all understand that this is something that we've never seen before. But I want to understand immediately what do you see as kind of the short and medium term impact of the crisis on the fundraising environment in particular? And what you would say to companies that need to raise money in the coming months, right? So uh, short term impact and kind of medium term uh, change in, in direction. And I'm going to start right now in order, but eventually we'll, we'll shuffle it up as we go along. But Noor, I'll kick off with you. Thanks. Thanks. I'll turn us all here. Um, you know, I think it depends on the industry that the founders are in. So some industries are picking up. You have e-commerce picking up. Um, supply chain issues. You have um, you know industries like health tech, which we're very excited. We just made an investment last week in a health tech company. Um, we're looking at more in health, more in ed tech, more in agri tech. So there's industries that are going to benefit from the change in the new world, as you put it. Those industries, I would say, are founders are raising more. Um, investors are excited. It's about what does the world look like in two to three years. And how are you actually going to grow to meet demand and if you have the capabilities um, to win in your space? For everybody else, um, as you said, it's going to be tough. And we've advised our founders really to think about what are your core competencies and how do you reposition those to leverage the new focus? And where can you take advantage of what is happening? Um, and all the founders have great core competence and great value. Um, so, you know, how do you use those as a question? And then you can raise money off the back of that value pump. So that's how we're seeing it. Um, but first, it's, you know, buckle up, tighten up, um, and, and kind of get ready for a really long ride um, and be as slow as you can during the time. Great. I'm going to ask a quick question to all of the panelists to, to, to raise your hands. Uh, raise your hand if you... Um, if you have written a check since the crisis or plan to write a check in the coming, let's say, six weeks. Raise your hand. Okay, so everyone's pretty much active. Hassan, maybe uh, less so. I, I'm going to dive into you and then come back to everyone. Why is it that, that you are, is it just that you don't have a deal in the pipeline or has this affected your uh, investment? Or did you raise your hand but there's a delay? No, no, I did raise my hand, but I think they have a I have an internet connection uh, issue. But in in general, we are I think we're going to be even more active uh, at the current time, um, and it's it's based on what stage we focus on. So since we are an early stage uh, investor, basically, uh, we feel like as an example, there will be a lot of opportunities that we will. Uh, a lot of I mean I think unemployment will increase, and this will basically push smart minds to really go and and hopefully build their uh, I mean to be pushed to do to build their dream or whatever startup they're thinking of building uh, and they didn't get the chance to uh, start with it I think this is a chance um, for us to identify these smart individuals who will be looking for uh, uh, building their own business. Uh, so I think we will be active and I think we're going to be even more active than before. Does anyone have a different position on this than that we are active? This is a great opportunity for the investment world. Um, everyone's going to, you know, everyone's gung ho about it. Does anyone have a contrarian perspective? Uh, it's a tough time. Uh, Money's uh, going to shrink. Uh, you know, uh, man, you have, you have something you want to say. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I'll tell you. Hi, Omar. Yes, I'll tell you something. I think the uh, the funding environment, to answer your question, will definitely slow down, for sure. But not because of lack of good opportunities. It's more of lack of uncertainty um, um, on the short term. People, investors, don't see what's going to happen next month. So there is there are good opportunities, but but the things will slow down for a little bit until they they you know they have more visibility. With them. This is, the, is that people, you know, people now realize that technology is the solution to all the problems. You know, we've been saying this for a while, but now people, you don't need to say it. Even my dad is talking about tech companies now and, you know, our old generations. So I think it will slow down on the short term, but on the long run, sky is the limit. Everyone will invest in technology. 
So we see it, we feel, especially if you're doing deal by deal versus VC, if you're a venture capital and you have a bunch of money waiting and you know, there's certain opportunities you want to tackle, fine. But if we're doing like our uh, deal by deal basis and stuff, this will, will be with this down for sure. Now for our companies, we have two companies uh, in our portfolios. We have the struggling ones, and for those we say, listen, raise at a lower valuation if you can, uh, look for M&A deals, merge with to work in. Uh, the booming ones, we, okay, it's good booming, great here growing, but preserve some cash. So if, if you have cash, that's prefer, don't invest. Um, um, so we get in like a marketing example, companies are not spending on marketing. So that's what we say, preserve cash as you're growing until we know what's gonna happen next. I, I'd like to ask a, a show of hands this one. Um, if you are today a company that's not one of the hot sectors that Noor mentioned, and we're gonna get back to these, these hot sectors that are you know, attracting very potentially high valuations or a lot of interest. If you're one of the sectors negatively affected, um, you would encourage startups to consider taking money at a lower valuation, even at a down round that they thought. Raise your hand if you agree with that statement, which is essentially Man's statement. Hassan raised his hand, Man raised, Noor raised. Walid, you didn't raise, and we haven't gotten to you, so I'd love to hear uh, why you, you don't agree with that one. Or maybe it's an internet issue. Well. Uh, well, I appreciate uh, everybody's patience. As you know, we figured out these new formats and connectivity catches up with the demands of the new world. Um, but um, I want, I'll, I'll pivot a little bit since everybody seemed to agree that the advice, if you need money, really be open to taking money at a cheaper valuation, right? Um, has this really shifted the, uh, I mean, are you going to invest, we're going to Deals in e-health, e-education, remote. Um, is that all we're going to see now? Are you still doing deals that are outside of these? Places? Uh, and maybe Noor, you want to start? Thank you. Um, well, um, you can mute yourself. Uh, I, sorry, I'm yeah, we kicked out of the meeting have you um sorry so and i was i i had shifted the conversation because we lost you so i was just trying to understand today uh, if this is a meaningful shift in the investment thesis or strategy of your funds beyond just a short term okay these sectors are hot let's get on some deals nah, nah direct i mean i can i'll mention that with you because mevp really led that deal that's uh, in a very hot space online grocery delivery um, is this a long-term shift in your investment thesis or strategy and what kind of shift do you see? Um, yes, of course, there's a shift uh, because sectors will be affected and demand will change. So, yes, I, my, the problem is uh, you can't really speculate on what will win. Or it's too early to say. So, um, you can really hear contradicting views on the same topic and and different opinions and i think at this point all opinions are are equal um pretending that there is no change it would be also uh, i guess we all agree on that point um offline to online migration is something that has happened and will be accelerated uh, there will be uh, demand dislocation and demand shifts uh, definitely for sure um, there are certain sectors that are uh, underdeveloped, um, you want to talk about health tech in general or uh, some of these new sectors where because of this COVID-19 confinement, we're discovering their, uh, um, basically their limitations. So uh, there are certain sectors that need investment. Whether that investment will come from VCs or corporates or governments uh, or all of the above, we'll, 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 we'll see about that. Uh, so there is a uh, also change in um, um, priorities, of course. Uh, I think the big issue is what are you going to do with the legacy world, right? So that's uh, so something that's also 
um, interesting to see because all of these uh, basically that these this whole bunch of companies that got good numbers, good funding, and now all of a sudden are are they going to fall behind? What is going to happen? What's going to happen to to that? Uh, I guess time will tell. Look, I'm I stopped trying to. Um, uh, predict. I don't think you can predict anything. You just go day by day. You see a good opportunity, you do it. Well priced, you do it. You see a good asset, uh, you go after it. Uh, you know, even if there are companies out there that are open to doing um, more funding, even if it's at a down round, why not? We're open for business. We'll take it day by day. Honestly, I don't think you can really uh, do more. Great. And I, I don't think anyone has a crystal ball, but our job here is to, to, to try to peek a little bit into that future as much as we can and give it whatever insight we can. And so, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this question and run with it a bit further. Today, we have what I would consider the obvious hot sectors, which we've discussed, right? Healthcare, education, uh, remote work, entertainment, etc. I'm, I'm curious to, to understand from you what maybe knock-on effects these might have, what other industries might grow as a result, um, and what opportunities have been maybe less noticed by entrepreneurs. So, I mean, you know, if we're gonna need all of this technology, if everything's gonna be online, we're gonna need much better internet infrastructure. So, you know, one place where we expect to see a certain boom is internet infrastructure. Um, uh, I'm curious if there are any knock-on effects that you've been thinking about as a result of these booms, and some untapped areas that entrepreneurs might not be noticing that you might draw their attention to. Um, you know, we haven't heard from Hassan in a while. I'll start with you, Hassan, and we'll take it from there. We lost Hassan. No, I think okay. there is a bit I was, of lag. I was no, no, I was, I was muted. So, okay, so basically, um, I mean, based on the verticals that are doing well today due to the COVID-19, um, as an example, uh, after, hopefully once this passes, like in the MENA region, content-based startups usually have, a, like face a lot of challenges to basically fundraise. Uh, and there's a lot of examples to that. Uh, I think, uh, after this challenge, this let's say crisis passes, we will like, like let's say content-based startups will have a better chance in in fundraising, and there will be an appetite for that. Since now we know that okay, uh, uh, we need these startups uh, to be there for us, not only when there is a crisis, but even. Uh, how important today we're learning how important it is to learn from home either if, if it was for kids or even for adults uh, as an example for me uh, i started to take a lot of d different coding programs uh, i never had the chance to do so but because of these platforms that are available i was able to do so and i think that's uh, one, one example personal example how, it is, how this COVID-19 affected me personally. So I think that's number one. Uh, uh, another thing with any other industry uh, other than the ones that are performing well get affected. Um, I think some of the, so let's say l l the focus of logistics companies can change, but I don't know if other complementary businesses will Will, will, will be built based on the COVID. I, I don't know if we can even build a, a long-term strategy on, based on what we're seeing today. I think it will take some time for us to have a clear view on uh, the impact of this. Uh, would there be a lot of behavioral changes or not? Uh, but in general, I think um, some of these verticals and mainly uh, the content ones will do well after COVID-19. Does anyone actually have a, have a different take on this and want to take a stab at these knock-on effects or kind of hidden opportunities? Yeah. Um, uh, a few days ago, 
Uh, I'm sure you all saw a slide, an infographic on uh, grow fastest 100 growing sectors and declining. And, and you know, uh, food, for example, all indoor activities are growing and all outdoors equipments and stuff are, are going, you know, are slowing down. But I think this is a short term uh, issue and things will go back to normal. Uh, because if you think about it, let's take you as an example. You've been doing a lot of virtual, like people are doing virtual stuff for the last 10 years. But I think now it will take more market share than traditional businesses. Um, like I'll give you an interesting um, uh, view. Um, co-working space, for example, I think will boom post-COVID-19. Because they're struggling now and they've been struggling since the WeWork story and all of that collapsed. But now I think uh, co-working space would do well because people will cut costs, no need for big offices. Some people will work virtually from home. And then let's take a small office here and there. So I think this sector will grow. And then I think the travel industry, no one is looking at that. This is one of the most damaged sectors. So I think if uh, South Africa can come up with solution in the sector, they do it. So I think travel and co-working. My view. Yeah. I think those are those are two industries. There's also a couple of others. You know, for us, it's um, there's a short term and there's a long term. And I think in the short term, consumer behavior will change, and, will, and that's very quick and drastic. And whether it's things like e-commerce, which Asia saw pick up massively after SARS, you know, the region has always been behind on e-commerce as a percentage of total spend, so that'll pick up and stay there. And those are positive consumer trends towards these startups that are permanent once consumer behavior changes. I think if you take a look two and three years down the line, what we'll see is a lot more in you know, we consider more innovative spaces. So I think there'll be a big pick up in robotics, think perhaps you know cleaning crews or food deliveries will be robotics in the future. So it'll be more more consistent with minimizing the number of people if computers or robots can do something. And that's already available from a technology perspective. It's just not commercially used in most parts, most parts of the world. But even in some parts of the world, and mall securities are more driven by robotics than they are by people here, it's still people. So you're gonna start seeing some shifts as well in commercial and industry behavior, not just consumer behavior. Um, and I think across the value chain of health tech, you start to see AI and quantum computing being a big force behind genomics and data. So if you're taking a look two levels deeper, like you were suggesting, Ahmad, what, you know, what is down the line, right? So you wanna do more um, data capture on DNA and on things to, to prevent future pandemics, you're gonna need the infrastructure on the quantum computing support and the knowledge to know how to do that. So there's across the, across the, um, the you know, across the board, there's quite a few that are two to three years to five years down the line, not just the immediate term um, that we're looking at. And I think that that goes to one of the questions that was asked on, you know, um, you know, is it, are companies better off having started already and now trying to raise, or is there space for newcomers in the health tech side? Um, I mean, as a fund, we're focused more on series A and B. And if you're a newcomer to these spaces, I would rather be a newcomer in robotics today than a newcomer in health tech because there's we have in our pipeline more than 300 health tech companies just in MENA. So when you stop and think about it, there's already a lot, it's a crowded space and you're gonna be a newcomer and people who've been established for two years are already signing good contracts that are picking up now. Um, but there's no one really thinking about what does the world look like or the new world look like two years from now or three years from now once all the investors are over our health tech craze, as Hamad put it. Really interesting and I think so kind of this, the, the thesis here is that we're going to see an acceleration of really bleeding edge tech. And if someone is looking to start something now, because I also had this question, what would your advice to, a, to an entrepreneur just starting is hit where the ball is going, not where the ball is today. Right? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's it. That's exactly it. Great. And thank you for taking one of the questions directly. And we've got some great questions. Uh, I'm going to ask one uh, of the panel questions because and I'm leading to it. First of all, I'd like to, to get a sense, how are your portfolio companies doing? And what are you doing to support them? Uh, the question here from Julian is, have you provisioned relief funds for your struggling portfolio companies? And if yes, which format? But in general, what are you doing kind of to support the startups in your portfolio? Or are you taking like a big boy pants approach? 
you know, make it or get out. You're gonna, you know, this is a sink or swim type moment. I'd love to hear, and, and maybe we can start with you, Noor, and then continue. Absolutely. Um, you know, so we're, we're trying to do everything at the same time, which is, um, which is all we can do. Um, so on the one hand, we are doing a lot on the community side and putting the founders together, um, working with them and our LPs. We started a webinar series for our founders. We're now in our fourth week of that. Um, so we have one again on Sundays on what does fundraising the down cycle look like, and that's with some of our LPs. Um, and we had worked through people culture a month ago and how do you maintain culture and people in such shifting dynamics all the way through sales and operations. So really creating a culture where they can share amongst each other what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and we're bringing in some industry experts along the way. So we're about a month into that. It's now super sailing on that and I think we're, we're getting some really good traction out of that. Um, on the funding side, which is I think what everybody just wants to hear about, um, some of our founders are doing really well because of the situation uh, and their business has picked up and their problem now is, you know, we need more working capital, right? So working capital is not venture capital. In this part of the world, banks have a very difficult time giving working capital to founders. So we're working with banks to see what kind of um, extension on debt and working capital they can give to established young companies. Um, and then on, you know, some of our other founders, it's more about how do you go into hibernation um, and yet be able to come out strong six months from now as this is um, And others, it's the runway and how can we be supportive. When we are extending capital, we haven't yet had to. Um, you know, some, most of the founders are in a very strong position, at least for the next six months. That's really going through scenario analysis. Nobody did a scenario analysis where things go to zero to 10% of what they were. And so it's what do you need? And we're happy to, you know, we work with all kinds of debt and convertibles and equity structures. So we're happy to work with our founders to get them to where they need to get to. It's not about um, boxing it in, it's about sharing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noor. Walid, maybe you can give us your, your thoughts on this. How are your startups doing and, and what are you doing to support them? And, and, and particularly, it seems the question is around funding. So are you extending some kind of bridge uh, funding uh, structures or uh, would, would love to hear your thoughts on this? Yes, sure. Uh, so um, I think in this time is, is very important not to throw good money after bad money if, that, if you have a situation like that. So always keep that in mind. So this is uh, the big boy pants that I was talking about. Right, like I've never heard of the big boy pants. I'd like. Well, to no, one. I mean it's the idea of like I'm sorry, you guys are not going to make it. It's tough love and good luck. But really, our advice to you is just you should shut down. Tough love. Look, that's not the first time we go through these exercises. You know, we've been doing this for more than a decade. So um, if it's called big boy pants, and then we have lots. Of <laughs> I, give you I mean, for the startups, I'm sure you no. guys have your big boy pants on, but the startups. Yeah. I go back to this, you can't throw good money after bad money. So if there's a sector that is, you don't believe in it or a company that you don't believe in it, I don't see why you would wait for COVID-19 to, you know, pull the plug. Uh, now, obviously there are changes and you have to go with it. In a sense, when we, we did our uh, 360 a deep, deep analysis of our portfolio, uh, we had very little uh, impact. I mean, extremely, like half of our portfolio is cloud enterprise, and that's soaring. Uh, we have crazy rates. We've also had a big position on last mile uh, groceries. Um, we have some nice fintech portfolio around six companies, new media and health tech. And alhamdulillah, it's been a, I think we're, most of them will go on the good side of things. We have very little exposure on e-commerce and food tech in general so i i guess you know uh that's uh, that's reality uh we would definitely support any company that's worth supporting and uh whether it's in the form of a bridge or an equity for me what matters is not not just the lineup of money is what is what is the really the story there right and if there's a repurposing uh we can do that if there's a acceleration we can do that we since early march we closed two transactions one in fintech and one in groceries and we did uh, one small exit and we approved another bridge so we did four transactions in march it's a very busy month 
So we're in business. We try try not to uh, look at the bad things. Try to look at the good things. But the the, the idea that you have to support uh, a company because uh, if you don't believe in its in its story, it's, it's just it's, it doesn't hold at any point in time. Why would it hold now? Um, but I I had a discussion with. Uh, a company that we were approached uh, recently that is struggling, and my advice to them was: uh, Look, uh, if you're if you if you think that you're not gonna get out of this uh, um, because you know could demand has evaporated or customers have you know changed their mind, etc., and you still believe that there is a repurposing story and you need capital to go through that story, then 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 actually do it raise people are listening we are listening if uh, you're in a segment that is going to be challenged or uh, you know uh, raise money uh, probably less terms out there but you know if it's in a one in a lifetime repurpose uh, exercise then does it really matter it doesn't so um, if the story holds um, Definitely, you should do it. But if you're gonna see a demand evaporation in your business and continue with the same story and just ask for money to to live live longer, three months, six months, nine months, then I don't see why would why anyone you know, support that. Clear, <clears throat> but here here again is kind of the the nugget for the old entrepreneurs is if you're in a struggling business right now. This is the opportunity for reinvention and potentially being able to get people's ears back because the world has just shifted. And if you can be re-relevant for the new world, there could be new opportunities for you, even from your existing investors. Yeah, of course. If the story holds and, uh, and you have what it takes to back it, the talent, the, the numbers, I don't see why you wouldn't. I mean, capital is here. Capital did not evaporate. If anything, there's, uh, you know, what's going on today with the world is people are liquidating assets and getting cash in to, to either cover losses or cover debts or, or, or what. So there is cash and uh, it will find itself into good opportunities. We're going to go into a low interest rate environment more and more and, um, you know, Great value today, and on uh, on Bloomberg was was saying that he na- he coined the term "cash is trash." I find this term to be funny. Uh, so the, there are there is there is there are opportun- there is cash out there for for good opportunities. The 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 question is at what term what terms uh, are we going to see the same uh, uh, appetite for 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 high valuations? Are we going to still believe that? We're going to be, you know, egging at, at higher valuations, be, being in the beginning of a new cycle. Um, how long How long is this? When do we start the cycle to start with? So all of these questions, a lot of uncertainty, and I don't see these questions answered anytime and anytime soon. So uh, um, there is cash. Repurpose your story. Uh, back it up. Um, but I think you have to be a bit pragmatic and, and, and lean about it. And uh, uh, as an extension, and it just came in, right? There's this this idea in this last very long bull run of the market. Everyone's high on cash. Everyone's spending cash like it's their job. Vision Fund is raising in the billions. People are spending in the billions. Um, uh, and and blitz scaling, right, is the word that um, Reid Hoffman came up with. Called his book blitz scaling, right? Do you see this changing? Do you see investors? Would, are you going to be looking out for more um, fiscal responsibility, more profitability, and less growth at all costs, more sustainability? Um, Walid, since it, we have you, we'll start with you and then we'll move on to, to Man and Hassan and, and then Noor. Look, I mean, uh, this is not a view that, that I had now. I've always had this view that... Unless you're able to to have a VC play that is um, that leads you a, a sizable in IP, IPO at the end, that's just the stuff you'd see in China and, and the U.S. Outside of that game, profitability 
unit economics, valuations are very important. Otherwise, the whole asset class doesn't survive. Uh, and I've always said that. And, and now I think we're going to go into a more scrutiny on what are you doing? You, you can't just keep on paying for the future, uh, hoping that the future will realize at every transaction. Companies that took insane amount of money in the past few years, and now that saw their demand evaporate or a massive down route, are a proof that there are no uh, guarantees in this cycle. So uh, yes, 100%, uh, we're gonna go into a world that is um, uh, more driven by profitability, the technology is not anymore a unique story. Uh, Tech-enabled companies, technology are over. Uh, people will have to really, really show that they're innovating, that they have a talent that is insane, that, that, that does not exist somewhere else. It's going to be, if anything, harder to justify uh, and build, build big businesses. Uh, localization is going to be more important. So all in all, I think, this is probably a good thing. We're going to get out of it for sure. This will pass. But I hope we'll get out of the more uh, rationalized and a more, um, you know, s structured <clears throat> conversation, dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Man, I want you to, to take that from there. I want to, but I want to, I want people to raise their hands as panelists. If you agree with this direction, we will see more scrutiny around path to profitability, around unit economics, around efficiency than we have seen in the past. If you agree, just raise your hand there. Okay, so everybody agrees with you. Man, if you want to comment, I, I heard someone call these rhinos instead of unicorns, right? Uh, companies that achieve a billion dollar valuation, but through uh, proper earnings and profitability. But uh, if you'd like to add some, some notes to that, Man. Yes. I think I think investor will be more cautious going forward. So we'll see a lot of cautious investments. We will see a lot of um, um, also, uh, you know, less um, like people will look will be more investors now are asking about yeah, as we said profitability, path of profitability. Uh, they're more careful of making investments. But I want to go back to your previous point, our uh, what we're doing with our companies because I think that's important. So the first thing we said to our portfolio companies, and I'm talking mainly about the Saudi ones, the 10, 12 companies we invested over the last year. We said, don't worry, surviving is winning right now. We don't expect you to make 20% month over month. We just want to survive. So what we did interesting was we have booming companies, booming sectors, and then we have the struggling ones. So what we did, we started bringing everyone together and creating synergies between these companies and business opportunities so they can benefit from each other. Another point I want to say is uh, in Saudi Arabia, the last, I would say, year and year and a half, the VC investing picked up. So most of the companies raised money around six months to eight months ago. So they have a little bit of cash to live for the next couple of months. That's something. So this is, it, it's good for us uh, as a VC because our companies now somehow, most of them have cash, but some are booming and some are not. So we created synergies between them and we're very active on this. This is our currently what we're doing. And this is kind of similar to what Noor was mentioning. For her, it was like a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning, best yes. practices, sharing how they're, they're responding to the crisis. And here it sounds like you guys are also doing this, but even further in terms of business development and potential operations. And M&As, and m &As. We have two or three transactions now. M&As. All As the M &A. company merges together, yeah. Yep. Excellent. Uh, Hassan, if you want to comment on this, and I'm curious, you know, this is also a question someone asked, if we're moving into this new world around that has a more of a focus on profitability, does that change what, what due diligence looks like as well? Uh, and and I, Hassan, if you could take that, uh, and Noor as well. We'll yeah. get, uh, yeah. I, th I think definitely, um, so, so the idea is not really to look at uh, profits today when we look at a company, but at least we need to understand that the founder understands that his business model would allow him to achieve profitability in the next five years. Um, going in and uh, basically burning cash and increasing revenue with, uh, without a clear idea of how to achieve, uh, let's say, the right unit economics uh then then that's something that we should avoid uh however what we're trying i mean as an early investor we're investing with people and people uh 
and I don't think this will change. Uh, when it comes to due diligence, as you just mentioned, um, we do look at the financials and unit economics, but we don't really look at uh, whether they're making profits or not. Um, so, so in a way, what I'm trying to say here is this. Our view before uh, COVID-19 and, and, and now, it's the same thing. Nothing changed. I think uh, WeWork uh, is an example of a company that we would avoid. Uh, there are similar companies in the region which try to do something similar and we passed on that. The uh, reason is we don't see the unit economics uh, there. We don't see that they have the chance to really uh, go and take all of these huge buildings, pay the rent, and, and hope for uh, tenants to come and, and, and uh, take the capacity. So I think in a way or another, uh, we did not change our view since we started, uh, but we are a bit more careful when we look at if the founder understands how to achieve the right unit economics. Clear. Uh, and Noor, if you have something special to add to that, and then otherwise, I'd like to, uh, there's a lot of questions about the relationship with LPs, and, uh, and so I'm going to move to that next. But uh, Noor, if you have anything to add to this. No, I think my fellow panelists have covered it quite well. Beautiful. Beautiful. And so uh, I think it's interesting. I'm curious how this is changing uh, the fundraising environment. Noor, I think you are raising right now. Walid, you're still raising. Right? Uh, Man, you do on a deal by deal, but Noor, you closed your fund? We closed our fund almost four months ago. Well, congratulations. My, day, my, my info is late. But uh, <laughs> no, what you say no, no, we... environment. We're very pleased that we're not raising, to be honest. It's, it's, um, it's, well, it's, then maybe we... we'll start with you about this. How is this changing the funding environment for funds? How is that changing the, the, the relationship with LPs? Do you feel pressure? Here are some of the questions we have about LPs. Do you feel pressure from them, first of all? And, and how are you gonna manage communicating to them the failure of some of the startups that they invested in? And how are you communicating with them to reassure them not to give up on this asset class more broadly? Uh, all, all questions have been asked about the LPs. Sure, so I guess we have a lot of aspiring fund managers in the audience. Yeah, I guess so, it's really interesting. <laughs> and I Great, guess welcome to the party. Investors who are, uh, are in attendance in the session, so I think that's also a, the Great. Um, I think we lost you for a minute, Ahmad, but, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and start answering these questions. Um, from, from our perspective, you know, we're very fortunate that our LPs are all sophisticated investors, whether they're individuals or institutions, um, and they wanted exposure to this part of Africa. Venture is always 5% you know, or less of anybody's asset allocation. So in theory, um, people are well protected. Um, explaining losses to sophisticated investors is something that requires a lot of patience. Um, and just like they're being patient with the capital that they've you know, entrusted to us as managers over seven months, um, you know, things go up and down. Um, our experience is very unique. I think we, um, you know, in my experience, we listed our company, we run our IPO for or in my prior life in April 2008. So for those of you who were participating in the economy in 2008, April was two months before the global financial crisis. In this case, we were fortunate that we closed our fund three months before this global pandemic. So it seems that there's, um, you know, we're very fortunate on the timing. Um, so running a public company on the um, IR side and the, uh, on the corporate governance and the regulatory compliance side, Reporting first year in 2009 to Fidelity and BlackRock was um, really difficult and great training for reporting to LPs first year as a fund manager after this pandemic. So I think everybody wants to know how bad it is. It's really hard to quantify and we're still in an illiquidity part of the cycle. We haven't yet hit the, um, you know, the insolvency part of the cycle. So as soon as we start getting to solvency issues, I think it's even more important to be transparent. When it comes to LPs, they want information, they want insight, they want access. So two weeks ago, we opened up our weekly founders call to our LPs 
So they can try, they can come in if they want to talk to any of the founders, they can ask questions, they can hear what the founders are doing to address things. Um, you know, and the founders are happy to have that support. So the more transparent we are and the more forthcoming we are, you know, two companies are in trouble, two are doing great, and the rest are muddling along, it, the, the more we get support. And I think that that's the most important thing for founders is to be transparent with your investors and for fund managers to be transparent with your LPs. Do you think in, and, and maybe I'll ask this to everybody, do you think in the new world, uh, the LP pool uh, is going to get larger? If you, if you agree, raise your hand. LP pool will get larger. More types of investors will be encouraged. Um, uh, I, right, right now, globally, there's $189 billion in dry powder within the VC community. So there's a lot of money to hold up valuations. There's a lot of money to smooth over the companies that as Walid and Hassan and Ma'an were saying, that deserve to survive in the sense that they really are creating value. They have a path to profitability, and this is a bump in the road. Um, most funds have dry powder to support those companies. And if you take a look historically, Airbnb was founded in 2008. That was the worst crisis the world had ever seen at that point. And there's a bunch of other companies. So it's actually a great time to start companies that can really create value, be, value and be financially viable from an early age. But so you think today that the that LPs do have the appetite. If I'm starting a new fund tomorrow, LPs mm -hmm. are who do potentially have the appetite. If you're if you're starting a new company in certain in a new fund in certain verticals that are going to um, really boom over the next three to five years, and partly maybe because of the new economy, maybe not, but you have a certain fund thesis. I think LPs are driven by theses, by investment opportunities, by macros as well as managers by many, many things. Um, and the question goes globally, if you want to take a look really, and to really answer the question, most of the funding trickles down from pensions and endowments globally. Let's keep the region kind of aside because the region follows what globally happens. And when pensions and endowments have a massive fall in public markets, then their allocation to venture shrinks because venture cannot exceed a certain percentage of their total asset allocation. And so because of that, they're trying to cover their public markets. So their allocation to venture will shrink. But just like any supply chain, it takes a while to knock on. So there will be a shrinkage in the ability to capital on a very macro level. That said, there's still at 189 billion in dry powder right now. And I don't think that the long-term LP appetite will shrink, perhaps in the short term. Thanks, uh, Noor. So this is looking at really kind of the, the big institutional uh, investors. What about family offices? And, and I'm curious to hear from, from Man, um, yeah. Do you think that this is going to get the family offices in Saudi? Because that's going to be where a lot of the money there is there, uh, for our region at least. Is that going to get them yes. more excited about venture capital as an class uh, or less? Yes. And the people you're yes. talking to, what, what do you hear? Okay, so if, um, if you look back a few months back, it was um, you would raise more money now from family offices and LPs than three months ago. Simply because of uh, two things. Uh, we have a good infra uh, tech infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. So that investment from the government did, did very well. Like we have a good infrastructure. And then people realize that technology is the solution to everything. We're staying home. We can pay through financial apps. We can order food. We can do e-government. So everyone now is calling and saying, hey, I want to be part of this want to be part of the future. Now we realize this is where the whole future is heading. So we would like to invest more in the sector. So we're seeing a lot of cash. Now again, because of the uncertainty, people are a bit slower, but they all have the cash ready to deploy. So yes, I see a lot of uh, traditional businesses will, uh, or family offices uh, will become more uh, tech investors now. And the government, I think, Amar. the GC, go ahead. Yeah, Hassan, no, no, please. No, no, sorry, 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 sorry. No, I was going to say, like, government realized that biotech, for example, like, governments will invest in that now, the biotechnology, because of the COVID-19 and stuff. So you see a lot of government money going into that direction. Yeah. Go ahead. Hassan, you were going to answer. Yeah, yeah, I have to, like, uh, I'm, I might not agree 100%, uh, uh, but... On, on basically on Anur and, and, and Ma'an's points, and I'll, I'll tell you how I think about this. When it comes to the government, 
basically today huge spending is been done is being done by by the by different governments to basically fight the covid-19 uh in the gcc uh if we're looking for the uh, in the region uh, in, the, in the gcc the dependency on oil has will have a huge negative impact on the the financial strength of the fin- of of all of these governments um there is a lot of I mean, talk today about government deficits and how they're going to cover these deficits. Now, is deficit a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm I'm saying, is there a plan to cover these deficits? Uh, there is a lot, there is a lot of talk uh, talks about uh, possible rating down downgrades for countries, uh, potential inflation or devalue of currencies. All of these things are really being. Uh, is spoken about, written about, and there is a good chance of ha- some of these happening. So when it comes to pension funds, when it comes to LPs that are basically uh, uh, government-owned, uh, I, I think for the short term, there will be a pause. And I think anyone, uh, Omar, said, if I'm going to be raising a fund, is this the right time? I don't think it's the right time. Uh, I think you'll face a lot of challenges, at least for the next year. Things need to settle down. Now, we know as a VC investor, we know how important technology is. And I think everyone now knows how important technology is. Um, But again, I think the fear of, okay, this is a health issue. Uh, Economy can shrink uh, even after COVID-19 passes. So I think all of these uncertainties will definitely affect uh, for the next maybe year. Uh, when it comes to family offices, uh, I think uh, family offices might be interesting. Yeah, fa- family offices might be receptive for uh, for investing or investing more, uh, unless their uh, their family office is leveraged or they have debts that they need to pay uh, or their businesses are affected. So I feel the next year. It is difficult to really raise a fund. I think uh, a lot of the VCs in the region are lucky because they just closed uh, their funds from sovereign funds. So, we, so the startups should also be lucky in the MENA region too. Uh, but I think if you're Omar, if you're thinking of raising a fund, just wait a year. Wait for a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And Noor, I guess that's a nod to you uh, that he is saying that you're you're lucky that you just wrapped up that fund. Uh, because because times are getting tougher, and uh, and everything that's going on, we haven't discussed the rock bottom price of oil and how that's going to affect government deficits and across the board the economy, consumer spending. Um, but uh, I, so there's a lot of questions that that we're getting about different industries. I think it's tough for us to answer all of these, but maybe I'll take one, which is looking at the early stage. Um, he, the question here is about startup studios, but I'm also interested to understand what do you think will happen to acceleration, right? Acceleration so far has been very much a physical activity. We have all these spaces. We have early stage startups. Uh, the question is also what will happen to startup studios, kind of the what adventure builders? Uh, how will this play out in the early space? I would love to hear. And, and since we have you, Hassan, maybe we'll start with you and then move on to others. Uh, Aman, we'll ask you yeah. next since you're very much playing in the early space. Okay, sure. So, so with accelerators, I think I think they should do well. Uh, like at least from what we've seen for the last month, we've been talking to a lot of startup portfolio companies and and companies that are in our pipeline, and we we're we're seeing different kind of uh, like how they're mitigating um, the risks of COVID nineteen and and uh, in a way uh, decreasing the costs and expenses. So. Unfortunately, there will be smart people who will be pushed out. And I think they won't find another place. Mostly, they won't find another place to go to in, as a career. So they would, they should think of joining an accelerator and finding that idea to work on within that period of time where after COVID, I mean, so that once COVID-19 passes, uh, they'll go directly and, and, and hopefully be able to fundraise. Uh, for their idea. Man, I'm, I'm curious as well to think like so much of the accelerator experience today is a physical experience, right? Like an incubator, there's being there in this space, there's meeting other startups, stumbling into opportunities, activities happening on site. 
I'm curious to see how you think that that will also be changed in, in Mahan. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, over for the last couple of years, uh, again, uh, we we already have virtual incubation and accelerators. We a lot of people do most of the stuff, the stuff are done online. So what I think on the short term, we see a lot of virtual activities, uh, accelerators, uh, programs, and and uh, less physical. But then over time, I think it will go back to normal. And I, I think this is it's not going to affect it. On the short run, yes, I agree. But once the market is back, I think accelerators and incubators will actually uh, become uh, very active, even more than before. OK. Uh if anyone else would like to add something before I move on, just raise your hand quickly for me, Noor or, or Walid. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. Okay. Sure. Uh, just a quick note. Of, I've actually built an accelerator, invested in one, built one. I think accelerators are very important in the creation of entrepreneurs. And uh, they will still be uh, those, uh, that, that layer of supporting people uh, become entrepreneurs is going to happen through accelerators. That's my view on it. They're not necessarily money-making investment. Great. Um, so I, I will give, uh, actually what I'm going to do with all the sector questions, I'm going to read out the sectors that people are interested in. And if there are any sectors that you would like to comment on something interesting, an opportunity, a challenge, or your perspective, uh, we, can, we can open that up to you. So First, someone was saying, how do you see public transport changing? Another one was mental health and mental health over tech. Lord knows that we're probably gonna have a lot of, uh, a lot of people <laughs> with a lot of trauma. This crisis is gonna leave a lot of us with a lot of trauma. Um, and I hospitality. Think, yeah, on that, Omar, you said to chime in. I think on that, that goes with, that's part of digital health, right? I think it's, again, consumer behavior is gonna shift drastically and massively to, to allow us to get used to things that we never got used to before. So mental health platforms, uh, finding therapists online and then doing uh, mental, ther mental therapy sessions online um, is something that's always been available but nobody really felt compelled to use. Um, now those consumers have moved over to online and therapists are instructed to do things online. And so you see a massive shift in consumer behavior that will likely be permanent. Great. Um, Hospitality and travel. I think this one is really tough because it went from he from hero to zero, and it's unclear how that will will really uh, sh uh, kind of come back. And it's not clear also how much of this could be virtualized, right? Like I go to uh, you know Sydney to see the Opera House or to Beijing to see the Great Wall. Is it is it replicating the same experience for me to see it virtually? Does anyone want to comment on on hospitality and travel? Sure. I think, you know, for us, it's, um, it's an interesting sector. We have an investment in that sector. Um, but I think that the changes, again, consumer behavior and the corporate behavior in this sense is going to be permanent towards travel less. I don't think we'll see corporate travel back at the levels that we've seen it at in the last two years for a really long time, if ever, given how productive everyone's discovered they can be not traveling. Anyone else have, have input on this travel and hospitality sector? A lot of businesses in this area really taking a beating. Hospitality, well, I, I would say. Go ahead, man, and then we're going to move to you, Hassan. Yeah, hospitality, if you talk about like uh, food tech, for example, like I say, I think you see less restaurants, more of the Ketopia of the world, the companies that you know, do uh, cloud kitchens, uh, delivery to home, anything that for home will grow. And I think if we go back to the public uh, sector question, I think because of change of behaviors, more people will be staying home. So more people will buy less cars. So that the Uber and Kareem will do well post COVID-19. That's, that's, that's right. how Once we feel comfortable enough to get into a car with a stranger, right? Because I think that's also yeah. going to take a while. Uh, yeah. Today, I, I was historically a purely a, 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 a Uber Kareem customer but today I don't use them at all because, because of COVID. So there's a double-edged sword on that as well. Uh, Hassan, you wanted to mention something. Yeah, I just, like, for me, I don't know, personally, I don't think, I think changes will happen, uh, but I don't think verticals will, will get effective, uh, affected uh, in a big way. So I don't think the travel 
tourism will will shrink as a vertical. I don't think, uh, let's say, uh, public transport will shrink. I think it's going to go back to normal and, and continue even to grow. Um, I think behavior, individual behavior might change, but we're going we're gonna to continue to attend conferences. We're going to continue to go and meet up LPs in person. Uh, I think it is, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, since things are easier, things are getting cheaper, we're going to continue to do that. Once with the fear of COVID-19 is out, we're going to go back to normal. Depends if you have a recession or not, no? I hope we don't go into this. But I think uh, if we look at what's happening... You are the, <laughs> you're the most optimistic person that I have talked to, Hassan, in at least four to six weeks, right? Like, that's the most positive response I've received. Uh, and, and it's also kind of quite different from what Noor said, which is she believes some behaviors will take years to recover, if at all, right? Like business. Uh, uh, look, I mean, I think there's two problems. There's the confinement problem and the fact that people are not traveling because airports are closed. And there is the whether we and there's the demand problem that's driven by price. For an industry like travel, it's obvious that no one's traveling, so no one is booking. If, if anything, people are canceling their booking. So that's a no-brainer. If you, if you have a view that the, the world will open up at some point, and I hope it does, then maybe actually there is a play towards a more efficient, cheaper travel. But uh, if you have a view on that we are going to go into a recession or slower growth, or hopefully not a depression, then, then anything that's discretionary spending is gonna be hit. Why would you shop online unless you have to? Why would you order unless you have to? So I guess it's really- I'm, I'm kind of in that, I'm in that world, right? I kind of see this as a, as a, as a far worse situation where, and, and, and Walid, that's also kind of disregarding anything related to shift in consumer behavior because of a shift in, in culture. Right? No. You're saying people are going to... price-driven uh, behavior. Beyond those, matter. right? And I'm giving you grants. You eat sushi every day on, and on lunch. I'm just giving a stupid example. But, uh, you know, m m people will at some point go into this. Some people would lose their jobs. Some people have salary cuts. There are no bonuses. Uh, there's an increase in, a decrease in income, etc. So I think, you know, why would you buy the latest uh, suit uh, from Gucci uh, online. Uh, it, there are things that, that will be for sure challenged. And that goes, goes into your daily, daily habits as well. I don't think if you're gonna get into an environment where every dirham or every dollar counts, you start thinking differently. And, uh, and that's something you saw, you saw before. Um, the, the utility value on the internet functions differently than, than the real world. You could argue, you could spend hours deciding whether you want to spend a dollar in an app, right? In a game. We all do this. We all go for an expensive lunch or dinner and pay, I don't know how much, much time, but then we, we struggle to pay a dollar in a game. Uh, I, I think, and that has to do with, with a lot of uh, parameters i think if you are in the view that there is going to be some form of recession and depression then fundamentally everything we know about commerce and delivery is going to be completely different and we're seeing this already in the data um, I, I, i'm of a view of a view of, of of eventually value so if you're giving real value to people such as cheaper travel better uh, cheaper lodging. Uh, you spoke about is Uber. Virtual. Uber is, is an expensive, is, is after all an expensive option. So I, I believe we have to, we have to follow that, uh, that demand shift and understand it deeper before, uh, or, or see it before we actually uh, see what's gonna happen. Um, I, we're just about at the end of our time. Uh, I ended my last webinar with this question and I want to end this one with it as well. It's a bit more philosophical, less practical, but interesting to hear nonetheless. Uh, a lot of people are seeing this as a, as a fundamental paradigm sh shift in terms of, of the world and how we function. Um, and the world could kind of go in, in different directions. One, it could be a moment for us all to, to get united, to collaborate more, 
to uh, understand that we have to face this together across borders, across nations, uh, to see this deeper uh, empowerment and deeper collaboration across citizens. And the other side is we see far more nationalist entrenchment, more competition because resources are getting more limited. Um, we see deglobalization, people bringing home their supply chains, people thinking more of themselves, how do they support themselves first. What, what is your view on this, uh, on this for, for the future? And I'll just take that really kind of quickly for each of you. I'll start with Noor, Ma'an, Walid, and Hassan, and then we'll wrap up. And, and try to, I would appreciate if you keep your answer short, but uh, I know it is a big philosophical question. I think that in the long term, it brings everyone together. It reminds us of our humanity. It reminds us of how we all, at the end of the day, are um, you know, susceptible to the same thing. Um, and how we, there is something larger than us all, and it brings us together. But in the short term, we're seeing, we're seeing the exact opposite, right? We're seeing this very much a lot of retrenchment. Like, I mean, countries outbidding each other for masks and PPE. Well, I think that, um, you know, people will always have some level of humanity and politics, um, you know, Will, will always play a role and because people want to, or the politicians and the, and the people that govern want to take care of their own people. And so they're doing this in the best interest of their people. But I think at the end of the day, everyone's just afraid and fear makes, pe makes people do um, irrational things sometimes. Um, however, the desire and the end goal is to protect and to save. I think the, uh, how the, government is going to manage and contain the COVID-19 situation will have a positive impact on its global ranking going forward. I think that's that's something that we, uh, we, we wait and see. Like Saudi Arabia did an amazing job in that. And I think this will reflect positively on the country ranking. Now, I think, Omar, to answer your question, uh, technology and globalization were part of the problem. And I think the answer is so I think it's time now for the whole world, from China to the US, to work together as one to rebuild the new future. To build the new future, basically. Okay. Walid? That's a tough one, Omar. Uh, I think uh, the first time many of us has, or most of us have probably heard the word COVID-19 was 90 days ago. And... Uh, that seems like a very far uh, time. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I'm an optimist. I always I've I've always say that all these things shall pass. Uh, we've endured much much worse things in in life before. So uh, I uh, I prefer to stay optimist. That's the only option we have. Okay. And Hassan, everybody seems to be optimistic. So are you optimistic as uh, well? Yeah, definitely. I think I think uh, basically this experience is really pushing different countries, cultures, uh, societies to really uh, work together to basically get this uh, uh, pandemic over with. And I think uh, although you're seeing these nationalistic nationalistic moves uh, and basically. Uh, everyone is going to their countries and sending others to their own countries. I think to do that, to basically they're doing it to fight COVID-19, but to do that, it also requires a lot of collaboration between these countries. So this is definitely an experience that is, push, that is pushing uh, different governments to work together. And I think that's, that's towards a long-term vision of uh, hopefully globalization rather than deglobalization. And on that note, uh, we'll wrap up our session. Thank you all so much. There were so many questions that came in, about 25 questions. Even if I were asking literally all the questions the entire time, we wouldn't have been able to get through them. So I apologize to everyone whose answers I didn't get to. Uh, um, we can share the questions with the panelists and if they have anything specific that they'd like to add, uh, certainly we can share back with the attendees. Uh, thank you so much, panelists, for, for taking the time to join us. Our best wishes to you and your family uh, for your health and safety. Please uh, take care of yourselves. And uh, we look forward to catching up with, with you and our audience uh, again very soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.